Okay, we're going to start. Um, more people are going to come on, I'm sure. Okay, this week's Parsha is the Parsha of Shlach, which deals with Moshe Rabbeinu sending the spies to check out the land of Israel, check out Eretz Yisrael. And um, there's a very interesting Rashi at the beginning of the Parsha. The Pasik says, Shlach Lecho Anashi. Meshav ben you should send spies. Hashem says, I am not commanding you. Ani ain't a mitzavaloch. I am not commanding you. You want to do it? Send the spies. My opinion is, you don't need to send the spies. The story over here is as follows. Hashem promised the Jews they're going to go and tear it to The Jews were afraid of the miracle. They, you know, they doubted. There was a generation of doubts and troublemakers. So they were doubting whether it's going to happen or not. So they came to Meshav Beno and they said, send spies, let's, let's check it out, you know, find out what's going on. So Meshav Beno came to Hashem and said, I want to send spies. Meshav, Hashem says to Meshav Beno, listen, you don't need to send spies. I'm telling you it's going to work. You want to send spies, send spies. So what happens? Meshav Beno sends spies. And at that time, they were all tzaddikim. All 12 of them were righteous people, Rashi's. Not only that, it says, by Yishloch Esa Mesha, Mesha Rabbeinu sent them, Al Pi Hashem. And the word of Hashem, meaning Hashem even agreed to send the spies. As everybody knows the story, the spies were in the, and checked out the whole length and width of Esa, which is a miracle of 40 days. Normally, it should have taken longer. They came back with a negative report. Hashem said, because of that, you guys are going to stay in the desert 40 years. And that's the whole story. I want to first discuss the a general aspect of this story and then go into the details of the story. Because there's a lot of details of the story that without proper understanding of it, the story doesn't make sense. But I want to start with the general concept over here. Hashem says to Meishe Rabbeinu, you don't need to send spies. The Jews wanted spies, so Meishe said, oh, you have to do it. So Hashem says, listen, I don't want you to do it. You want to do it, do it. Now, the obvious question is, why did Meishe Rabbeinu do it? Was he, he wasn't afraid of the Jews. Meishe Rabbeinu, when he had to scream at the Jews, screamed at the Jews. Meishe Rabbeinu, was somebody, somebody totally connected bottle to Hashem, completely. Like it says in last week's parsha, B'chol Beisi Namenu, Meishe Rabbeinu, whatever Hashem wanted, Meishe Rabbeinu wanted. Why in the world is Meishe Rabbeinu sending spies when Hashem basically says to him, I don't want to do it. So why is he doing it? And then the question is more. In the Haftar of Parsha Shlach, in the Haftar of Parsha Shlach, the Torah speaks about spies that Yehoshua sent to Eretz Yisrael. Okay? And the Pastor comes, he sent him to the city of Yerichi. Yerichi, he sent to the city of Yerichi. And he said, spy out the land, check out the land of Yerichi. And they came back with a very positive report. Okay, meaning, they said, we're not going to learn from the old spies that came back with a negative report. We're going to come back with a positive report. What is the difference between Meshe Rabbeinu spies to conquer the land, to check out the land of Eretz Yisrael, and Yehoshua spies that were Yerichai, the city of Jericho, as everybody knows, the city of Yerichai. What is the difference between Meshe Rabbeinu spies and Yehoshua spies. So the Rebbe elaborates in a minor. The whole minor is basically discussing this. It's in this in, in the minor by Yishtach Moshe and Shlach Luchan Hashim. And the Rebbe explains the following. In Tanya, we learned that there is a Benini and there's a Tzadik. A Benini doesn't sin, not in thought, not in speech, not in action. 
Why isn't he a tzaddik? Because the Benini still has the Yunefer Shabbat is the Yetzirah. <clears throat> he didn't transform, he didn't kill it, which is the lower level of a tzaddik, and he definitely didn't transform it to Kedusha. So a Benini basically controls thought, speech, and action. To be a tzaddik, now the Rebbe explains in Tanya, you need to be born with the ability to be able to become a tzaddik. You have to be born with the ability to become a tzaddik. Not every person could be a tzaddik. Not every person is able and capable of killing the eight Sahara. Nevertheless, Dr. Rebbe says in Tanya, a Benini should try, try, and even if it doesn't go, maybe Hashem will help you along. Maybe Hashem will give you a nisham of another tzaddik, you know, impregnated in within you. So the point over here, the Tanya, is exactly the difference between Meshe Rabbeinu and Yeshua over here. The seven nations of Canaan represent the seven bad midas, the seven emotional traits of evil. That's what the land of Eretz is for, the land of Eretz, Canaan represents, the land of Canaan represents the seven bad, the seven nations, the seven levels of evil. Meshe Rabbeinu wanted to send spies to conquer the land. Hashem says to Meshe Rabbeinu, listen, I cannot command you to, spend, to send spies to edit to throne. Why not? Because the conquer the Nefesh Abamis, the, the conquer to be a tzaddik, not every Jew is able to do that and not every Jew is supposed to be doing it. So here we're talking with the land of Canaan. Moshe Rabbeinu wants to send spies to the land of Canaan. And he says, let's try it. I want to do it. Hashem says, I cannot command you to do it. Why can't I command you to do it? Because when Hashem commands us to do something, that means we could do it. Any myth we learned many times. Hashem does not demand from a person to do something they can't do. So therefore, Meshe Rabbeinu, if Hashem wants us to conquer the seven nations, then he would command us. But because we can't, because only a tzaddik of Tanya could do that, Hashem can't command us to do it. He can't command us something we can't do. Unless we are tzaddik. So Hashem, now everything makes sense. Hashem says to Meshe, listen, I cannot command you to send spies to conquer the seven nations. But Meshe Rabbeinu said, but we know, like Dalt Rebbe says in Tanya, yeah, you can't, but try anyway. <clears throat> try and see if you could get anywhere with it. Try to do it. So therefore, Meshe Rabbeinu, the leader of the Jewish people, Meshe Rabbeinu comes along and says, you know what? I know we're not commanded to do it, but let's try it anyway. Like Dalt Rebbe says in Tanya, Rabbeinu, he can't be a bit tzaddik. But you should try to kill the Yetzirah, try to despise evil, and only love Kedusha. So Meshe Rabbeinu said, let's try. And obviously it didn't work, because they came back with a negative report. Yeshua, on the other hand, in the Haftera of this week's parsha, sent the Jews to Yerichai. It says in Chassidus in Kabbalah, Yerichai comes from the word reach, smell. There's a story in the Zayar, a little child, a Yanuka, there was a unique kid in the Zayar. You say it was Rav Amnon Esava, but whatever, there was a kid in the Zayar. And the Zayar, this kid went over to some great tzaddikim, and he said, from the smell of your garments, I could tell you didn't read the Shema yet. That's what the kid said. From the smell of your garments, I see that you didn't, like Karina Shema, you didn't read the Shema yet. So it says in Chassidus, Reach smells is a level of garments. <coughs> garments are thought, speech, and action. 
That's the thought, speech, and action of the, of the Yiddishkeit. The seven nations of Canaan is transforming the Nefesh Abamis. Hashem said, I cannot command you to do it. But Meishe Rabbeinu did it on his own. Even though whatever Hashem wanted, Meishe Rabbeinu did. But Meishe Rabbeinu understood as a leader, we have to try. Let's try to send spies and then she come back with something positive. It didn't work. But Yeshua, he said, we're going to Yericha, meaning thought, speech, and action, the garments that every Jew has the ability to conquer. Every Jew could be a Bainani. If every Jew could be a Bainani, then Hashem is saying, you know what? I mean, Yeshua is saying, go for it. And they did, and they came back successful. So this is the difference between, the, in the general concept, why? Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. If Hashem says, no, I don't want you to do it, why is Meshul Rabbeinu doing it? And why was Yeshua spy successful? But this explains the whole thing. The Rebbe explains it in mind beautifully that this explains the whole thing. It's Meshul, Hashem says, I cannot send spies to, to, to conquer Eretz Canaan because a Jew cannot conquer the Nefshabamas, only if you're a Tzadik. So, but Meshul Rabbeinu said, but we got to try. Hashem, you want us to try so therefore, eventually, Hashem said, I'll be Hashem. Yeah, I agree to it. You want to try? I cannot command you. You want to try? That you can do. The spies of Yeshua, on the other hand, to go to Yericha, thought, speech, and action, the smell, the garments, that already every Jew has the ability to do. There's a very interesting some sefer over here. Meish Rabbeinu, it says the names of the of the Shvatim. We're going to soon discuss a lot of details in this Miraglim story. But there's a very interesting, you know, Yeshua was called, he, originally he was Hoshea. Then he was called Yeshua bin Nun. His father was Nun. That was his name. Bin Nun means the son of Nun. So Lachayra, he should be called Yeshua ben Nun. Like Yitzchok ben Avram. Why is he called bin Nun? So there's a lot of different answers, but some Sefer says a very interesting, I don't want to call it cute, but there's a very interesting answer that some Sefer says, and that is as follows. We know, where did Hashem get the Yud? His name was Hoshea. Hashem added a Yud, Yehoshua, that Hashem should save you from the Meraglim. Where did he get that Yud from? So it says, Avram's name was changed to Avraham, and Sarai, Mrs. Avram, her name was changed to Sarah. So, so it says in the Farshim, what happened? Hashem took the Yud, which is 10, from Sarai, and he made two hays out of it. One he gave Avram to Avraham, he added a hay, and the other hay he put for Sarah at the end of the word, Sarah. But the Yud came with the complaint. The Yud, tells in the, there's a medrash. The Yud came with a complaint and said, you took away my letter from such a holy lady. It's not fair. Okay, you split me into two, two hays, but I'm the letter Yud, and you took Yud away. You took me away. So Hashem said, this is what the Medrash says, you were the last letter of a woman's name. I'm going to put you a Yud, Yehoshua. I'm going to make it the first letter of a man's name. Okay, so that's what happened. So now the Mephosh, the Samsefer says, a very beautiful, Samsefer says like this. But the Yud of Sarai, was, had no vowel. There was no vowel. It's the last letter, Sarai. So the Yud is not a vowel. It was just a letter. Now that Hashem took the Yud from Sarai and gave it to Yehoshua, but the Yehoshua, Ye Ye there's a Shva there. There's a, you know, the two dots, one on top of the next. Yehoshua. Where did the Nekudah come from? Where did that Shva come from? So the Chesam Sefer says, it was supposed to be Yeshua ben Nun, a segel, which has three dots. Hashem took two of the dots and made it the Shva of Yeshua. 
And then it's left with one dot, so it became bin the chiluk, it became bin nun instead of ben nun. It's a very interesting chsam sefer, but that's what chsam sefer says, why it is called Yeshua bin nun and not Yeshua ben nun. Okay, but that's the general aspect of what we discussed, why Meshe Rabbeinu didn't do something that Hashem said, I cannot command you to do. And we explained, Hashem can't command them to do it, but Meshe Rabbeinu wanted to try like Hashem wanted them to do. Okay, and now the question is like this. Um, without, truth is, I don't know, maybe Mephoshim, I saw, I've seen a lot of Mephoshim, the story of Meragum, but it's still all very difficult to understand the way they explain it. And this is where the, the Hasidic interpretation of the whole story of the Meraglim actually makes it so beautiful and profound and so, so to speak, making sense. And that is as follows. Let me ask a number of questions and then we'll discuss the whole Meraglim. When Meshe Rabbeinu sent the spies, it says they were all prominent people. Rashi says, Ba'esa Shah Shadam Hanu. When Meshir Abenu sent them, they were all Sadiqim. Kulam Anoshim, Roshe Bene Yisrael, they were Jewish leaders. Okay, they were heads of the tribes. Why did they change their minds? Why did they come back with such a negativity if they were all such Sadiqim? And Hashem says, I'm giving you the land. Hashem says, you will have the land. So aren't these heads of the Jewish nation, don't they believe in Hashem? And they're, when they sent them, they were tzaddikim. All of a sudden, 40 days later, they came back with such a terrible report that Hashem decreed they have to stay in the desert 40 years. That's question number one. Question number two, listen to this. The Meraglim said, we don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. Okay? Eretz Yisrael is terrible. We can't go into Eretz Yisrael. What was their punishment? <laughs> they stayed in Eretz Yisrael. In other words, they got exactly what, I mean, sorry, they stayed in the desert. They got exactly what they wanted. They said, we don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. We don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. So therefore, what did Hashem punish him? Okay, you guys are going to be another 40 years in the desert until you all die. That's exactly what they want. So what punishment is that? Another interesting question is, when Meshach Rabbeinu was arguing against Hashem, you know, to, to, to stick up with the Jews, Hashem says to Meshach Rabbeinu like this, but Amru we just get the Pasik here. So Moshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, you know what happens if you kill out all these people? If you kill out all these people, people are going to say, listen to this Pasik. They're going to say, me bilti Hashem. Hashem does not have the ability to bring, what are, you're going to kill out the Jews in the desert. So what are the nations going to say? Oh, God couldn't bring the Jews to the desert. To Eretz Yisrael, he killed them in the desert. How is that going to look? But you know what the expression is? That Hashem can't to the land that you promised them. He slaughtered them in the desert. Or in Hebrew, he shechted them in the desert. What type of expression is that? The Moshe Rabbeinu should have said, and you killed them in the desert. The Goyim are going to say, if you kill out all the, uh, the Jews for this incident, so the Goyim are going to say, Hashem doesn't have the ability to take the Jews into Israel to conquer those strong nations. But Yahar again by Midbar, he killed them. What do you mean? The, what do you mean? Shechita. You don't shech people. What type of expression is this? And it's an expression Torah is using. What type of expression is that? Another question is, the Miragul went to Eretz Yisrael. Okay? They were told by Meish Rabbeinu, I'm the job. I want you to go to Eretz Yisrael. I want you to check out the land. Is it strong? Is it not strong? Is it 
strong people is at the fortified cities, not fortified cities. I want you to bring back the fruits. Okay. What happened? They came back with the exact report. They said exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu sent them to do. The cities are strong. The people are strong. Look how massive the fruits are. What did they do wrong? Moshe Rabbeinu sent them on a mission. Bring back a spy report. And they came back with a spy report. Exactly all the questions Moshe Rabbeinu asked them. They targeted. So what, was, what did they do wrong? Another interesting question. Um, why did Meshir Abeinu only daven for Yahushua, not Kalev? Meshir Abeinu daven for Yahushua, says in the Pasuk. Meshir Abeinu called his name. He called Vayikra Meshir Yeshua ben Nun Yahushua. And he said, why am I changing your name? Because I want you to be safe from the spies. So why didn't he change Kalev's name? In fact, Kalev himself, Rashi says, went to Hevrein, because he wasn't blessed by Meshe Rabbeinu. So Kalev went to Hevrein, to Davin by Avram Yitzchok and Yaakov, to be safe in the Magdala. Because Meshe Rabbeinu, Rashi says in the Medrash, that Meshe Rabbeinu didn't bless him. So therefore, Kalev had to get his own bracha from Avram Yitzchok and Yaakov, from the grave. So why Taka did he only bless Yeshua, not Kalev? Another question is, we know that in Yiddishkeit, there is a minion. A minion is 10 people. Okay? How do we learn out a minion is 10 people? Because it says by the spies, Meshe Rabbeinu called them this bad community. This bad Eidah. Um, okay, he called them the Amati Loeda Horazes. Meshe Ben says, Ad Masi Loeda Horazes. Hashem said to Meshe Ben, How much longer these bad people, this bad community? Now, there are 12 spies, two came back positive. Okay, so how many were negative? 10. So the Gemara says, how do we learn how the minion is 10 people? Because the traitor calls 10 of the spies, the bad spies, he calls them a dog community. So from there we learn out that a community is 10 people. The question is, there's no better place to learn out a minion of 10 people only from negativity of the spies? You couldn't get a different Pusik, a positive Pusik in Chumash that teaches us that something positive? Why is it learning out a whole concept of a minion from, from negativity? Okay? So let's discuss now the whole thing in a prop, because these are very powerful questions, by the way. Number one, they were good, all of a sudden they became bad. Secondly, what type of expression is this shechita? Why do you learn out a minion from there? Why didn't Meshe Rabbeinu daven for Kalev also? I mean, like, the, all the things don't make sense. Why, how, would, how did the story happen? So first of all, I just heard an interesting word that why did the Meraglam not want to go into the throne? A very interesting word. I never saw it anywhere, but I heard it the other day. And that is the 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 the, the, the spies, the Miraglim, were completely dedicated and devoted to Meshe Rabbeinu. In last week's Pasha, Baleischa, when Meshe Rabbeinu, you know, the Jews complained, where's the beef? And Meshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, I can't handle this. Hashem takes 70 elders in the whole story. Eldad and Medad, two guys with the same prophecy in the camp. What was the prophecy they said? Meshe is going to die 
and Yeshua is going to take us into Eretz Yisrael. That was the prophecy Elder Dumeidot said. Rashi quotes it from the Medrash. The Mesh is going to die, and Yeshua is going to lead the Jews into Eretz Yisrael. The Meraglim heard that. They said, uh-uh. If us going into Eretz Yisrael means Meshach Rabbeinu is going to die, we're not going. It's a very profound concept. They were so devoted and loved Meshach Rabbeinu so much. They said, Meshach Rabbeinu, if going into Eretz Yisrael means Meshach Rabbeinu is going to die, we are not going into Eretz Yisrael. So they came back with a negative report. And we find this in another place later on in Chumash also. In Parshish Matis, later on in Chumash Bamidbar, Hashem says to Meshe Rabbeinu, Nukem Nikmas B'nai Yisrael Meisa Midyonim. Okay? Meshe Rabbeinu was told by Hashem, take revenge of the Jews from the nation of Midyon, and then you're going to die. And the Pasik says, Elif Lamata, Elif Lamata, Luchol Mata Yisrael. Hashem basically told Meshach Rabbeinu, every single tribe, including Levi, has to give a thousand people. Okay? So how many people were there? 13,000 people to go fight Midian. Then the Pasuk says, Vayimosru me'alfa Yisrael, they forcibly took from the 12 tribes, Elef Lamata, thousand, 12,000 tribes, 12,000 soldiers. It's a contradictory Pasuk. The first Pasuk says, even Shevet Levi had to give 1,000 people. That would make 13,000 people. Then it says they forced the Jews to give the 1,000 per tribe. So there was only 12,000, but there was supposed to be 13,000. So the commentary's answer over there, very simple. Rashi says this also, when the Jews heard that Hashem says, take revenge from Midian, and then you're going to die, the Jews said, we're not going. We don't, we're not, we don't want Meshach Rabbeinu to die. If after the war against Midian, Meshach Rabbeinu is going to die, that's what Hashem says, then we're not going. So it had to force the Jews to give 12,000 Jews. But one tribe went willingly. Which tribe was that? Levi. Levi doesn't ask questions. Meshe Ben is going to live. Meshe Ben, it's not our business. That's God's business. Levi, tribe of Levi, did what God wanted them to do. Period. That's it. They did everything Hashem wanted. And the same thing over here. The Miraglin heard that Elder the Maida said in their prophecy. That Meshe Rabbeinu is going to pass away. And Yeshua is going to take the Jews in Texas. So they said, that we're not going in Texas. So we don't want to go with Yeshua. We want our Meshe Rabbeinu. And that's it. That's one concept. But the Chassidus, it explains a whole different point. And this is going to answer all the questions together plus. And the Rebbe explained, I mean, based on that, the Rebbe, all the Rebbe and talk about this. There's two types of tzaddikim. There are tzaddikim that work with themselves. They don't go out there into the world. Similar to the concept of Noyach. And there are tzaddikim that go out into the world, elevate the world. There are many, even today, we have religious Jews. They, so many Jews seclude themselves in a ghetto style, not to become affected by the world. And other people go out into the world. In the Midbar, in the desert, the Yidin had nothing to worry about. Food, they had the money. Drinks, they had the well. Protection, clothing, cleaning, laundry, growing, stretching the clothing were the clouds. What did the Jews do a whole day in the desert? They learned Tata. They studied Tata the whole day. 
Meshe Rabbeinu sends the spies and said, listen guys, vacation's over, we're going to go into Eretz Yisrael, and you're going to have to start working, and you're going to have to start cultivating, and you're going to have to do all the mitzvahs there in the agricultural mitzvahs. The Meraglim came, they went to Eretz Yisrael, you were tzaddikim, okay? But there were tzaddikim, the Meraglim, were tzaddikim that felt in order to have proper Yiddishkeit, you need to be secluded. You need to be secluded to have, because otherwise world will affect you in a negative way. And there are many tzaddikim even today. Many religious Jews lock themselves up in a ghetto, like we said, and they to, to protect themselves. They're afraid of the outside world influence. So the Meraglim come into Eretz Yisrael, and they say expressions like, Eretz Echeles Yeshvehi. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. What does that mean? It's a land that's going to consume the Jew. He won't be able to learn. He won't be able to daven. They said to Meish Rabbeinu, you're gonna, he, he can't work for the Jews. They were used to the Midbar. Okay? Let's stay in the Midbar to be, to learn and to daven and to do all these things. We don't want to go out into the world. What was their sin? Their sin was not such a terrible sin. Oh, even God can't do it. That's their sin was, yes, logic, you're right. Logically, you're 100% right that business is going to affect our learning and davening. We're not going to be able to learn a whole day. We're going to, our minds are going to be in our business and eating and sleeping. And we're going to have to, you know, all the problems of life. In the desert, everything was great. But that's not what Hashem wants. Hashem wants, Dira betachteinu. Hashem doesn't want to make a dwelling place in Kedusha. Then God could have stayed in Gan Eden, in a world of holiness, and not create this physical world. Hashem created the physical world. Whatever reason, He wants Dira betachteinu. He wants a dwelling place down here. The Beraglim couldn't get it. They, they weren't able to reach that level. It wasn't because they were wicked people. Their wickedness was the fact, bottom line, that that's not what Hashem wanted. But in Indian, in theory, they were right. We're going to go and die. So why can't we stay in the Midbar forever? Have the Mon forever. Have the Meshe Rabbeinu forever. Just let's have it with a good life. Why do we have to get involved in it? Hashem said, that's not what I want. So what was their punishment? Hashem teaches them one thing. But in order to go into the land of Israel, i.e. into the worldly world, you need the preparation of the desert. And I'll explain it in a practical sense in a minute. Hashem said, before you go into Eretz Yisrael, you need to be prepared in the Midbar to fortify yourself be able to go into Eretz Yisrael. Because then, if you're fortified, Eretz Yisrael will not affect you. And that's why the Torah uses the word Vayishchotein Bamidbar. What does it mean, the Shechita? We know Shechita, besides the Gemara, and Shechita Lemashem. Shechita means it prepares the food to be eaten. The only way you're allowed to eat meat, if it's Shechita, Shechita is not stop killing the animal because you can't kill the animal and eat it. Shechita is you're preparing the animal to be able to be elevated by the Jew. So Hashem says to the Jews, listen, the ultimate goal is to go into Eretz Yisrael and you're going to go anyway. But because of your attitude that you think you will become affected by the land of Israel, business and every agriculture and all that stuff, I'm going to keep you 40 years in the desert. For what purpose? That you should be prepared to go into Israel 
that instead of the land affecting you, instead of world impacting you, you affect and impact the world. And that's why the Torah uses the word Vayishchate. And this answers why we learn out a minion from the Meraglim. It's a very important lesson to have experience. <clears throat> Remember we just said, in order to go on Teich Yisrael, you need to be first in the midbar. you need to have the month, you need to daven, you need to learn a whole day and nothing else bothers you. Then you can go out and take on the day. What the Meraglim basically is the concept, seclude yourself from world and do holy things. Why do we learn now from the Meraglim? The Torah is teaching us a very important lesson. When you daven, you need the attitude of the Meraglim. When you learn, you need the attitude of the Meraglim. What does that mean? When you learn and when you daven, and you're doing mitzvahs, your approach, your attitude has to be, there is no world. There is no Eretz Yisrael where we got to work. There is no business. There is nothing. That's exactly what the Meraglim did. The Meraglim were holy people. Their mistake was, that's not what Hashem wanted. Hashem wanted a world. Don't you go in and make a dinner with the a dwelling place down here. The Meraglim said, no, we need to seclude. We can't be affected by, by worldly things. Hashem says, yes. And that's where you're going to learn out a minion of davening from the Meraglim. Because when you daven, you need to have the attitude of the Meraglim. That what? Nothing else exists. You're davening. There's no phone. There's no business. There's nothing. There's no disturbances. There's no distractions. The only thing you're doing is davening. You're learning. There is no telephone. There is no distractions. There's no business. We learn it out from the Meraglim. Because when a person davens, they need the, atti the, at the attitude of, of the Meraglim. And that also explains, the Rebbe explains, why Meish Rabbeinu didn't daven for Kolev, just for Yeshua. Because as we mentioned before, there's two types of tzaddikim. There are tzaddikim that deal with themselves only, and there are tzaddikim that deal with the world. Because Yeshua was going to take over from Meish Rabbeinu, a Jewish leader needs to be a leader even over the worldly things. That's the definition of a Jewish leader. It's not enough for a, a proper Nasi, a proper Rebbe, a proper Jewish leader to only seclude themselves from the world. They're Rebbe of the whole world. They have to deal with worldly things. So therefore, Yeshua, because he was going to take over Meshe Rabbeinu's job, so therefore, Meshe Rabbeinu davened for Yeshua. Kalev wasn't going to become the next Rebbe. Kalev could have been that level of the tzaddik that secluded. But Kalev understood it. So he went to daven Yitzchut But that wasn't Meshe Rabbeinu's issue. Meshe Rabbeinu, in, in Yiddish, it's called Kabavon, he had to make sure that Yeshua shouldn't fall prey to the Atsas Meraglim. Like he says, Yo Yeshia Chami Atsas Meraglim, when he called him Yeshua, Rashi says, that Hashem said, Meshe Benu said, May Hashem save you from the, from the Meraglim, from the Eitzah, the advice of the Meraglim. Again, because the Meraglim wanted to stay in Eretz Yisro. And Yeshua as a leader can't do that. Yeshua as a leader has to go take the Jews and in, in give them over and instill within them, internalize within them this concept of world has to be elevated. And therefore, the Rebbe explains like this. Before a person goes, you know, this is daily also. The Jews come out of Mitzrayim. They first have to be in the desert. Okay? In order to go into Eretz 
took him 40 years. By Yishchotim by Midbar, Hashem prepared them for 40 years that not only did they seclude themselves, they fortified themselves in the desert to such an extent that the world will not affect them. And then you can go into Eretz Yisrael and you can accomplish what you need to accomplish. The Rebbe says this is the lesson for every single Jew on a regular day. A Jew needs to know before you take on the day, before you go out into the business world, before you go out into whatever world you're going into, First, you need the midbar. First, you have to be in the desert. You have to daven. You have to learn a little bit. You have to instill within yourselves the strength that then when we go out into the world, in the desert, they prepare themselves. That then when you go on to the day, not God forbid the world affects you, but on the contrary, you impact the world and you affect the world in a positive way. So that answers basically the whole concept, the whole difficulty with the miracle. Now everything makes sense. They were not such bad people. The Torah calls them to show him later on because that they, they, on their level, they should have understood what God wanted. And if God didn't want what they wanted, then they should give in. But not that God forbid they came along, that God forbid even God can't conquer the land. Come on, they, you're talking about holy people. Can you imagine these holy people, that even God, so to speak, even God, they, they implied, even God can conquer it. Come on, you're talking about holy tzaddikim. But that wasn't what they meant. They said, world will affect the Judaism of a Jew. And that cannot happen. And that's where it says they were so, weren't so bad. And therefore it explains the expression by Yishchotim by Midbar. It, why we learn out a minion from the Miraglim and all these things. Because, and why Meshir Rabbeinu Davin for Yeshua? Because as a leader, you have to have all these things. Okay. Next is another interesting thing over here. And this, I'm just going to say over a piece of Tanya. Okay. Let's get the story straight, just the story in Chumash, okay? Meshir Rabbeinu picks the spies. They go, check out the land, come back. Tishabov was, Mara says, was Tishabov, and the Jews cried. Meshir, Hashem said to Meshir Rabbeinu, you know what? These guys are crying nothing, for nothing. I'm going to give them what to cry about. When they destroy the base of Migdash and Tishabov, that's what they're going to have what to cry about, okay? And the Jews complained, and they said, we can't, even God can't take it, and we're not going to be able to handle it. Okay? So, Hashem tells to Meshe Beinu, what's going on over here? I'm going to kill them, and I'll make you a new nation. Meshe Beinu starts arguing. Okay? And he says, you can't do it. You have to forgive him. God, you can't kill the Jew. You have to forgive him. Okay? So now, it sounds like this. Meshe Rabbeinu screaming at the guys, okay? And then he says like this, Meshe Rabbeinu screamed at them that you did a terrible thing. It's the two Jews in Perak Yudal and Posiklamites. And the Jews were mamish touched by Meshe Rabbeinu. Meshe Rabbeinu screamed at them. What do you mean you can't? What do you mean God can't? Are you crazy? Are you doubting? Meshe Rabbeinu gave him a speech. The next morning they came, got up. Listen to this. So let's get the story straight. One day they're saying the land is so powerful, even God can't do it. Meshe Rabbeinu screams at them, what in the world are you talking about? And he gives them a, a Musa's, you know, admonish, admonishing speech. They started crying. The next morning they wake up and they say, okay, we're going. Meshe Rabbeinu says it's too late. You can't go, God's not with you. It's too late, you blew it. And they went and they were destroyed by Amal. Okay? Now, what changed overnight by the people that in the morning they got up and said, we're going to go? Did Meshach Rabbeinu do a super miracle to say, you see, 
I can do miracles. God is going to do a miracle. You're going to conquer it. So he didn't do anything. Just let's analyze the situation. The Jews screamed, God can't conquer the land. Even Hashem cannot do it. Meshach Rabbeinu screams at them. And all of a sudden they say, okay, we're going. What happened? Why did they change their mind? You're not talking about fools over here. Babies, you know, wishy-washies. The Gemara says about the Midbar was Dorodea. They had a tremendous understanding. They were brilliant understanding people. All of a sudden they wake up in the morning and they say, okay, we're going. I mean, why, what, all of a sudden God got stronger or they got weaker. Like, what's happening over here? So the Altarebbe says in Tanya, this is what you see. The Amuna that every Jew possesses. Every Jew, no matter who the Jew is, possesses an unbelievable emuna in Hashem, belief in Hashem. Sometimes it gets covered over by the Yetz Sahara. It gets completely concealed by the Yetz Sahara. And the emuna is blocked. And that's exactly what happened with the Miragun. And the people. Not that they didn't have a Muna. They had a Muna. But it was covered. With the negativity of the Miragli. What did Meish Rabbeinu have to do? He didn't have to show him miracles. Meish Rabbeinu took a stick, so to speak. Hypothetically speaking. He took a stick. And he hit them. And he took off the hard covering that covered the essential emuna that every Jew had. By screaming at the Jews, all Meshe Rabbeinu did was remove the peeling, the shell, the hard shell that developed on the Jewish emuna, and he got rid of it. He, he disintegrated it. And then the Amun of the Jew came out. And therefore, Meshe Rabbeinu didn't have to show them a new miracle. But all Meshe Rabbeinu did was, hey, listen, guys, you know what? You can't do that. We're going to scream. You're gonna, we, I'm screaming at you. And then they had the moon again. Meshe Rabbeinu said, guys, listen, it's not going to work now. Because it's too late. You blew it. There's a story with the Rebbe. in the earlier years, one time I had a the Rebbe said he wants something done. It was a difficult thing, but I had a the Rebbe said he wants something done. Right after the Fabrain, the Chassidim had made a me uh, meeting. At the meeting, at the meeting, they came out with the conclusion that we can't do it. We can't do it, with the, we can't do what the Rebbe wants. The way the story goes is they told Rabbi Groner that we tell the Rebbe we can't do it. Rabbi Groner said, I'm not telling the Rebbe such a thing. And the Rebbe called in the, Rebbe, the next day, Rabbi Groner, and said, what, what happened? What's going on? Uh, basically, he told the Rebbe, they, they said they can't do it. So the Rebbe was very angry. Not, I don't even use the word angry in the Rebbe. The Rebbe was very, very upset. He said, I said they could do it. They could do it. Why did they come along and say they can't do it? I told them to do it. That means they can do it. So he gave all the message. And they said, okay, then another emergency. We're going to do it. The Rebbe said to them, now it's too late. Now it's too late. When I told you to do it, I gave you the ability to do it. You copped out. He said, we can't do it. Don't tell me now you could do it. It's too late. What? One? <laughs> Never too late. No, no. As I'm saying, over here, you find the same thing by the miracle. Hashem gave them, Hashem gave them a mission to go 
check out the land that we could do it. And by the way, I, I left this out before. This was the whole sin of the Meraglim. There's another point. The question was, we mentioned before, they, did they came back with a report exactly what was supposed to be. So what did they do wrong? They came back exactly what the story is. There's one word that messed it all up. When they came back and they said like this, um, okay, they said, they said, but the nation is too strong for us. God, and this is a very important Jewish illness. Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem Shliach, Moshe Rabbeinu, said to the Jews, find out if they're strong, weak, powerful, this, fortified, not find out. They came back with a report. And then they added one word. But they're too strong for us. God, Meshach Rabbeinu didn't ask them to see if they're stronger, we could do it or not. Meshach Rabbeinu said to them, tell us details, because we want this to be understood by the people when they're going to conquer it. So they should understand what they're doing. Not only blind faith, they should understand it. They came back with an exact beautiful report. You know what? Then they said an opinion. Meshe Rabbeinu said, I don't ask for opinions. Don't give me opinions. I ask you to find out facts. They came back with the facts. Beautiful. Wonderful. You know what I don't like? Don't come back. I know nobody asked you for your opinion. Jews have that tendency. They love to say opinions, what everybody else should be doing. Meshe Rabbeinu was, and that's what the whole sin of the Magdalene is that one word. But but is already an opinion. Hashem sends a person on a, on a shlichus, on a mission. Every person needs to know, don't give opinions. Do what you're told to do, and that's it. Once you start giving opinions, you blow it. Because Hashem doesn't need your opinions, and Meish Rabbeinu doesn't need your opinions. They need you to be the shliach for them to do what you need to do, and not anything else. Okay, this one last point. That is, there's another mitzvah in this week's parsha to leave the spies for a minute. And that is the mitzvah of separating chala. It says in the Pasik later on, the Vayachem Oritz, okay, when you come to the land of Eretz and you're going to eat the bread, Reishis Arisei one of the mitzvahs in the title, that's one, three mitzvahs given to women. The beginning, the first of your dough, and you should give it to the kohen. So we know a woman bakes bread, a woman bakes challah, or a man for that matter, it doesn't matter. You separate, you make a bracha even, you make a bracha, and you separate challah, and you burn it because we don't have a kohen today to give it to. The Rebbe once spoke for graduating girls. The Rebbe said, what's the lesson from this mitzvah? The lesson from the mitzvah is, Hashem gives us everything. Okay? Everything is from Hashem. Hashem doesn't come along to a Jew and say, okay, listen, all the money you make, give me at least 50%. After all, without me, you get nothing. You know what? Hashem could say technically, give me 75% and you can keep 25%. That would be also proper. It's all from Hashem. So Hashem said, listen, you make $100, keep 25 for yourself and give me 75. Like the lawyers don't know. No, I hope nobody's a lawyer, but that's the how you would be. That's what you You take most of the money. Hashem says, no. I want you to separate a little bit. I want you to give me a little bit. I don't want your whole thing. You keep the whole thing. Give me a little bit. But what I do want is reishis arisei seichem. Give me the first. Give me the best. I'm not asking you to give me everything you own. But when you give me something, don't give me junk. That was the sin of Cain and Hevel. Cain brought the carbon of junk and Hevel brought good stuff. And Hashem accepted Hevel and not Cain. 
Hashem said, I only want the gracious of Isaiah. I only want the, the first. But give me the first, give me the best. In fact, that's why the Rebbe fought that in the schools, the many schools, because of the problem with teachers, many schools have secular studies in the morning and then Hebrew studies in the afternoon. And the Rebbe was adamantly against that. The Rebbe said a child comes to school in the morning, they're fresh, they're ready to learn. By the afternoon, they're tired already. They're learning secular studies. Do that in the afternoon. Tater, the first part of the day, should be given to God. Hashem says, you want to work? You can work as much as you want. Give me the beginning of the day. At the beginning of the day, don't do everything else. Davin, learn a little bit. And that, that's the first. I want the first. Don't give me the whole day. Don't give me a whole day learning. Go do business most of the day. All I'm asking, Hashem says, give me the first of the fruit. Give me the best. Give me your best time, your best involvement. That's all I'm asking from you to do. And that's the lesson of Chalan. That's the lesson of the Meraglim. And there's a lot of other lessons of Tzitzis, but it's too late. I just want to mention one thing. That Amir Tzashem, this is obviously for the locals, but not this Shabbos. Not the following Shabbos is Gimel Tammuz, the Rebbe's yard site. Amir Tzashem in Chabad of Beverly Hills, we're going to have a Shabbaton with Rabbi Manus Friedman. We're going to have a Friday night dinner and Shabbos day and not Mitzvah Shabbos because he has to go back to New York. But we'll meet Hashem having a Shabbaton with Rabbi Manus Friedman. So de more details will be out by Wednesday night. I'll be able to tell you more details. But uh, you'll be informed of this um, Shabbaton more details. Anyway, everybody have a good week. Mitzvah Hashem, hopefully we'll see you Wednesday night at 8.30 for Allah and Tanya. And everybody should be, like they say, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Oh, man. Oh, man. Stand, don't stay in the desert too long. Just a little bit. Okay, bye. Thank Good you. Good night. Bye. Thank you.